good evening. I'm obviously thrilled to be here, delighted and very much honored to be the last speaker in this series. Um, from everything I've heard, it's been an extraordinarily successful series, and so it's a bit daunting to bring up the rear, and especially when somebody says best for last, I mean, you know, um, well, I'll leave that to you to judge. Um, I am taking a little bit of comfort from the first word in the title that was negotiated between me and the organizers, namely our. It's a nicely plural and inclusive pronoun, and at least we're going to be in this together. Um, the topic, as Gordon has already said, is incredibly important and timely, and events south of the border from your perspective keep reminding us just how important they've become in, in the recent past. Just last Thursday, for example, a week ago, the US Fish and Wildlife Service had to defend itself for having told two of its employees not to talk about climate change at upcoming international meetings on the Arctic. One expert had been invited. One expert, as I say, has be, had been invited by the World Wildlife Fund to advise Siberian villagers on how to avoid polar bears who are shifting their migration paths as sea ice is affected by climate change. What could possibly be wrong with talking about that? According to a spokesperson for the Department of Interior, the reason was standard policy. The subject was not on the meeting's agreed upon agenda and hence could not be officially talked about. There was nothing, she said, to keep the employees from talking about climate change over a beer. <laughs> For me, as a lawyer and analyst of contemporary politics, a story like this looks ominous at the same time that it is farcical. On the one hand, it displays the increasing global integrating power of science, which can bring together Siberian villagers, environmental NGOs, government scientists, and the media in a shared respect for each other's knowledge. On the other hand, it illustrates how deeply science, trust in science and in scientists has eroded in even one of the most, world's most robust democracies. To me, this sort of story, and regrettably there are too many of them these days, indicates that the topic we address tonight is of the utmost salience. How should we, as citizens of a complex and interdependent world, surrounded on all sides with the products of science and technology, Think about our rights and obligations in relation to these two central in institutions of modernity. Can we play a meaningful part in governing developments that lie far outside our domains of knowledge and experience? How, with the best will in the world, can we insert ourselves into debates that seem so often to take place in the closed worlds of corporate decision-making, expert advisory committees, a non-accountable bureaucratic power. What in short is our role as informed citizens of contemporary knowledge societies and do we have the means, the competence and not least the will to carry it out? My answer to that last question is yes. Of course it would be funny to say no and sit down but I, <laughs> I won't pretend that it will be either easy or straightforward. We will need to rebuild our trust in science on new, more interactive foundations, and it will certainly require more active questioning of ourselves, our experts, and our governing institutions than we've been prepared to undertake in the recent past. Let me begin, though, by questioning the very notion of trust and ask why we think science has any special claim on ours. There's almost a metaphysical question that we have to pose to start with. How can we, how can any one of us, have trustworthy access to anyone else's reality? Much of reality about the natural or social world comes to us infinitely mediated through complicated channels of transmission. For instance, many people in the United States today, and possibly also in this room, know almost everything they know about the risks of climate change from seeing former Vice President Al Gore's Oscar-winning film, An Inconvenient Truth. But this is a hybrid work, the combined creative vision of a talented director, I'm told that the Oscar award sits on his mantle and not on Al Gore's, an evang evangelical politician, and many dedicated scientific advisors. 
Not surprisingly, it has its detractors and its doubters. For some, the very fact that a political figure feels the need to make such a film undermines its credibility. If climate change, on which there is such strong and growing scientific consensus, remains so contested as public knowledge, then how can we arrive at common understandings, let alone solutions for, any of the multitude of problems that confront the peoples of the world? How can we gain reliable knowledge, facts that we can count on? For us descendants of the Enlightenment, the answer once seemed pretty clear. Science, by its very nature, was the prime producer of reliable knowledge. The scientific enterprise, continually validated by its technological manifestations, was thought to represent reality in ways no one could question. Science's truths were universal truths that could be universally accredited. Writing in 1966, the British physicist and science observer John Zyman made science synonymous with public knowledge. Scientific reality, he said, is constructed through public experiment, creating a common foundation of knowledge and experience. Zyman asserted, we are all entirely conditioned to accept as absolute and real the public view of things that we can share with other humans. For that public view of things, Zyman and most of his contemporaries assumed that we would naturally turn to science. Decades of work in the history, sociology, and politics of science and technology have taught us to become skeptical of assumptions like these. We now know not to take for granted on most issues that matter that there is a single public view which we can unequivocally share with other humans. Quite rightly, we've been conditioned instead to think of consensus itself as an achieved state, the product of painstaking human toil rather than of nature's brilliant lightning flashes revealed to equally brilliant individual minds. We understand very well why, like the building of Rome, the project of adopting the metric system was not finished in a day. In fact, you're further ahead of it than we are where I come from. Why accounts of human evolution, race, and intelligence remain perennially contested, and why supposedly new natural phenomena, such as climate change or biodiversity, take so long to arrive at anything resembling universal acceptance. If it takes such long and arduous social work to make science believable and technology functional, then why do we still treat scientific claims as especially deserving of trust? The pioneering American sociologist of science, Robert Merton, gave a classic answer in a 1942 article called The Normative Structure of Science. Writing in a time of world war, when scientific integrity was under attack from totalitarian forces, Merton provided a ringing defense of why science is entitled to be left alone in the ivory tower. The special status of science, he argued, derives from four commitments which together make up the special ethos of science. These four were universalism, or the testing of truth claims according to established impersonal criteria, communalism, or the common ownership of scientific knowledge, disinterestedness, or the compliance with codes of integrity in order to promote trust, and organized skepticism, or the questioning of all forms of vested authority, including religious or sacred authority. These common virtues, Merton argued, warrant scientists' claims to effective self-government and thus to protection against state, state control and not, incidentally, also to our trust. Since the 1940s, however, we've learned to recognize that science, no less than any other organized human enterprise, is propelled by personal ambition, hunger for material rewards and social recognition, jealousy, intellectual bias, and in the corporate university, the desire to keep one's external paymasters well provided and happy. One does not have to dig far into journalistic archives to find stories of scientists who violated the Mertonian creed, keeping knowledge and its fruits to themselves in disregard of the ethos of communalism, 
I was told that some people in the biological sciences maintain two sets of file cabinets, the ones marked, you know, mine and the mm. one marked everybody else's, um, like his and hers, I suppose. Um, producing self-serving knowledge, the classic example is what we in the States call tobacco science, in flagrant violation of disinterestedness, concealing troubling results instead of subjecting them to the organized skepticism of their peers. A case that rocked the world of science just a couple of years ago and was addressed earlier in this series was that of Dr. Hwang Woo-suk, South Korea's most celebrated stem cell scientist who had fabricated results and violated ethical norms in work that had led to publication in leading science journals such as Science Magazine itself. Journalists, often the friendly in-house critics of science, also as often first bring these individual transgressions to light. But more systematic studies of flows of money and knowledge within the university have shown that the very notion of public knowledge is under attack today in the face of increased private involvement that undermines anything approaching the norm of doing disinterested science. Governments today positively encourage academic researchers to seek private gain from their discoveries. Nonetheless, the scale of entanglement is sometimes staggering. Berkeley's Department of Plant and Molecular Biology, for example, came under heavy fire in 1998 for entering into a five-year, $25 million contract with Novartis, the biotechnology giant. Just this year, the University of California again gained notoriety through a half billion dollar agreement with the petroleum giant BP to develop alternative biofuels. Interestingly, the chancellor of the University of California called this plan, and I quote, this generation's moonshot. Only the Apollo program, as we recall, was publicly funded and carried out under state supervision. The Berkeley BP agreement is not. But why should it matter who funds science or how research agendas are set? Well, part of the answer lies in the intricate, often invisible ways in which cultural biases and social interests get bound up in the production, transmission, and maintenance of particular ways of seeing and knowing reality. In particular, when ideas and sometimes ideologies get bound up into material forms, it can be fiendishly difficult almost impossible to adopt more democratic or more collectively beneficial alternatives. So for example, we cannot shift overnight to a carless society, even if we know that our vehicular emissions are hurting the global environment. At a somewhat different level of significance, the conventional typewriter's QWERTY keyboard survives despite all kinds of ergonomic and efficiency studies that have shown it to be less than optimal. It matters then who drives the agenda of scientific discovery or the paths of technological development. Once the wheels are set in motion, there may be very little the public can do to change the architecture of the resulting technological systems. All of this puts the issue of trust in science on a more urgent footing than it has been for nearly 50 years. It seems that many standard assumptions about what keeps science and scientists honest and still less what ensures that technological developments will benefit the public at large, no longer hold true in a more and more privatized economic and political universe. In particular, it seems increasingly old-fashioned to think of science as a disinterested vocation, an ivory tower enterprise that people pursue for the sheer pleasure of discovery. Indeed, as I've already mentioned, government funding in many countries, including my own, is now conditioned on scientists being able to show that their work will bring identifiable and tangible benefits to society at large. Both public and private interests in Western societies have long since determined that they need science to advance their ends. Much of the developing world has now come to the same conclusion. We're squarely in the era of what the science policy analysts Michael Gibbons and Helga Novotny have called mode two science. In this way of doing science, it's the tie-in to social concerns that gives science its claims to legitimacy rather than standing apart. It's how enmeshed it is. So in mode two science, 
knowledge is increasingly produced within contexts of application, that is all science is to some extent applied to science. Science is increasingly transdisciplinary, that is it draws on and integrates empirical and theoretical elements from a variety of fields. Knowledge is generated in a wider variety of sites than ever before, not just universities and industry, but also in other sorts of much more invisible research centers, such as consultancies and think tanks. Participants within science have grown more aware of the societal implications of their work, and publics at the same time have become more conscious of the ways in which science and technology affect their interests and values. While the coupling of science and society has grown tighter in these ways, the stakes in science's success have also grown much larger for all concerned. Science today is more competitive than ever before, with nations fighting to win the best minds, the most skillful hands, the most citations, and the largest number of patents. The consequences of going down wrong roads in science or technology, whether through error or deliberate deceit, can also be much more damaging than when innovation was linked to specific local conditions in small village scale community, oh, sorry, in small village scale economies. Clearly then, we live in a vastly different world from that of 1942, when the greatest threat to science seemed to be the overriding of scientific autonomy by dictatorial states. Yet it's remarkable how regularly the Newtonian ideals, especially skepticism and disinterestedness, are still invoked as the primary basis for our trust in science. These two quotations are typical. Um, so I can't uh, read the, the things uh, on this little screen, but you can see what they are. Uh, the great thing about science is that you don't have to trust the other guy. You can always go and check his findings. And this is from the uh, publication that represents scientists' interests in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And the second quotation is taken from a government document, uh, which was in and of itself quite interesting. It was a document issued by our Office of Management and Budget, which is the economic arm of the US executive branch. And it was part of an argument designed to channel all peer review of regulatory science through the OMB. So in no sense was the, was the end result a disinterested result. But to justify it, um, science and peer review and how peer review keeps science honest and full of integrity was again cited. So in each, each of these cases, the authors point to science's internal process of skepticism and review as the chief guarantor of legitimacy, as well as a bulwark against the need for greater democratic involvement. So the first quotation is by an author who doesn't like the idea of public engagement in science and technology, thinks it's too political. And the second one is by a government agency that's trying to consolidate peer review within its own walls. And yet, you know, they're citing uh, science's internal process of skepticism as justification for what they want. So this is ironic, to say the least. These defenders of science are advocating a retreat to internal controls at a time when science and technology are increasingly assuming regulatory power over human lives. One justification for this position is that public simply are not capable of governing science in our increasingly fragmented, specialized, expert-driven, and bureaucratically administered societies. Let me briefly describe the main elements of that argument before turning to the last part of my talk in which I'll sketch a different conception of scientific citizenship, one that elaborates how we can meaningfully reassert our role in bringing science and technology into closer alignment with democratic values and aspirations. So the last 30 years have put on the science policy agenda of many Western nations a concept that looks democratic on its face, but has turned out on closer inspection to be enormously de-skilling and disempowering of ordinary citizens. This is the movement known as the public understanding of science, often designated by the rather unfortunate acronym PUS, or with the addition of technology as PUST. For decades now, it's been a major preoccupation of science and technology policymakers in the West to measure how much or how well their publics understand science and to reward efforts to increase that understanding. 
the American Association for the Advancement of Science, on whose board of directors I served, the leading US organization devoted to representing scientists' professional interests, offers an annual award to reporters who best promote the public understanding of science and technology. In Britain in 1985, three leading science organizations established a committee on the public understanding of science to promote better communication of science to the public. Over a decade ago, Britain's Science Museum and Institute of Physics together established an international journal named Public Understanding of Science. Back in the US, the National Academy of Sciences maintains an office on public understanding of science, Opus this time, though not Opus Dei, whose stated mission is to foster, and I quote, to foster the mutual responsibility of scientists and the media to communicate to the public with accuracy and balance the nature of science and its processes, as well as its results. Needless to say, the subtext is the nature of science and its processes as scientists understand it and not as STS scholars have wished to depict it. Every two years, the US National Science Foundation publishes in its survey of science and engineering indicators a chapter, the influential chapter seven, on public understanding of and attitudes to science and technology. Several themes consistently emerge from these wide-ranging activities. First, although science is favorably regarded by many people, PUS measurements continually demonstrate that the public doesn't know as much, as, as much science as the scientific community deems desirable and even necessary. Second, this gap in knowledge and understanding is widely seen as threatening the future of science, promoting beliefs in pseudoscience and alternative medicine, undermining support for basic research, and in the US, offering aid and comfort to proponents of creationism and other aberrant beliefs. Third, leaders of the scientific community invariably advocate improved communication in order to raise the level of scientific awareness among the public. Fourth, these claims and beliefs in turn are used to justify ongoing programs to monitor the uptake of scientific knowledge by publics. The NSF's survey of public attitudes is the most systematic of these efforts, but comparable surveys have also been undertaken in the European Union and a number of its member states. Let's look more closely at what the scientific community has concluded we need to know about what the public knows of science. On the NSF surveys, the US public is routinely asked 10 questions designed to survey knowledge from various scientific and technological domains, from elementary physics to genetics and evolutionary biology to the nature of lasers. Although the response fractions have changed a little over the years, some broad patterns have remained steady. People have trouble, most trouble, explaining what a molecule is, and there is highest awareness of the theory of continental drift. About half the respondents don't know that the Earth completes its circuit of the sun in a year, or indeed that it does so at all. Similar numbers think that the earliest humans coexist with, coexisted with dinosaurs. And are we surprised women consistently do worse than men in answering these questions correctly, especially those questions that in any way implicate the physical sciences? Needless to say, the overall rate of right answers also varies with the respondents' educational level and training in science and technology. To some degree, these results also vary by nation and region. Findings like this have generated endless hand-wringing among scientists and industrialists who seem convinced with rather little evidence that public support for science would increase if only people knew more scientific facts. Differences between European and American responses to biotechnology, for example, the Europeans being much more against than Americans, particularly on agricultural biotechnology, though these are barely significant, have been taken as evidence that lack of knowledge leads to rejection of technology, despite the fact that scientifically educated Americans actually seem more skeptical of the claimed benefits of technology and biotechnology than their less educated fellow citizens. There's been a lot of wailing about the persistent inequality of scientific understanding between women and men. But let's step back for a moment from the survey results and ask what's going on when such questions are put to national publics. 
What are the survey designers hoping to accomplish and what use is such work in societies that must centrally orient themselves around the products of science and technology? One point that needs to be emphasized is that PUS surveys don't just test a respondent's understanding of science, they simultaneously construct the respondent as a particular kind of knower or non-knower as the case may be. A person is seen as ignorant and presumed to be irrational or at the very least incompetent to participate in the governance of science if she or he does not know a list of preordained facts. Yet the knowledge we need to govern effectively is never so easily packaged nor so unequally distributed between experts and laypeople or between men and women. In many cases, it turns out that the difference between scientists and laypeople is not that one group simply knows more than another. Rather, we find that different forms of relevant knowledge are held, accumulated, and valued by different communities. In a well-known study of reactions by radiation workers and sheep farmers following Britain's Chernobyl fallout crisis, the sociologist Brian Wynne showed that there were competing ways of understanding the migration of radiation from soil into grass, from grass into lambs, and from lambs into meat on the table. Radiation experts were not simply better informed than farmers about these pathways. More to the point, they were differently informed, and in some ways less so than the lay people whose lives they were trying to regulate. Failure to take such differences into account, Wynne has con convincingly argued, leads to a deficit model of the human subject as someone who lacks the basic knowledge, skills, and competence to participate in self-government. This would be a poor sort of citizen for democracies to work with as they confront, confront the challenges of living with science and technology in the 21st century. Fortunately for us, there is a very different way of thinking about who we are as citizens of knowledge societies, and that is the notion of what I will call the knowledgeable citizen or the knowledge-able citizen. This notion has been developing in administrative law and practice now for more than 50 years. In that history, we as individuals and groups have been gaining increasing power to look behind the technical reasoning of governments and to some extent also private actors to offer our own counter arguments and countervailing expertise and to challenge reasoning that strikes us as unsubstantiated or unbalanced in some way. Let me briefly list these knowledge rights, as we may call them, and indicate, again very briefly, where we can find them in contemporary legal systems. So the right to know is now legislatively, legislatively well enshrined in various sorts of freedom of information statutes, statutes including our own FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, from the early 1970s. In addition, we are entitled to know of exposure to various kinds of risks, such as toxic substances and their releases. We are entitled to know about the problematic aspects of many consumer products, including pharmaceuticals, through warning labels. And we have discovery rules that enable us to get behind um, th things that corporations are prepared to disclose and ask them, at least under certain circumstances, what else they've got hidden in their data banks. The right to give informed consent. Of course, it originates in the physician-patient relationship, but in effect, that kind of idea has become generalized, for instance, to the export of pesticides from one country to another, where the receiving country has a right to demand information and to withhold its informed consent. The right to demand reasons. This is in the administrative law of many countries. For America, it was the 1946 Administrative Procedure Act that built in a generalized right to ask for reasons and then to participate and offer expertise if you have any relevant expertise. And then terribly important, rights as well to challenge irrational decisions and the right to appeal at least to a second level of the court system. So taken together, these largely 20th century legal and administrative developments project a very different idea of who we are and how we should imagine our democratic responsibilities than all of the survey research on public understanding of science. 
important for tonight's discussion, these provisions, which are almost as important for citizenship as are our constitutional guarantees of personal liberty, point to a very different take on trust than the PUS model. Whereas the public understanding framework presumes that we should unquestioningly take on board the eternal truths of science, the questioning citizen model that comes out of administrative law and practice presumes that good societies are based on reasoning, not facts, and that we are capable, collectively if not alone, of holding our rulers to higher standards of reason. That capacity of citizens to detect failures of reason is something that elites in technologically advanced societies forget at their peril. What you see on this slide, by the way, how many of you have seen this picture or one like it? Not, it's not any longer that well known. Um, all right, what, what you see here may be one of the worst miscalculations ever made by a government minister in dealing with a problem of expert credibility. The principals in the scene are John Gummer, then the UK Minister of Agriculture, and as such, one of the people with frontline responsibility for assuring the safety of the food supply. With him is his little four-year-old daughter, appropriately named Cordelia, to whom the minister is feeding a hamburger in a public display of confidence in the government's continual refrain of the time that British beef is safe to eat. In the background, you see the omnipresent apparatus of the news media, an essential feature of today's complex knowledge societies. What we see here is not simply a father performing a basic ritual of parenting, getting food into the mouth of a recalcitrant offspring, it is a performance of the British state in action. But let's see if we can read from this pictorial text some of the elements that bear on our concern with trust. We observe to begin with that trust here is embodied. The onlookers are being asked to put their faith in John Gummer for who he is and what he stands for, a responsible public servant and minister of the crown. He hopes, he expects and hopes to command trust because that's what people in his position are entitled to do. It's a form of ministerial prerogative. Second, we note Gummer's recourse to a common sense experiential mode of establishing trust. Anyone can understand a message about food safety that is delivered by putting food into a child's mouth. Indeed, one question the news media kept popping to government officials throughout the history of Britain's mad cow crisis was whether they and their families still ate beef. British beef. Of course, they all stoutly said they did. Without too much overreading, we might also find in this scene a reenactment of Britain's classic cultural commitment to empirical proofs that is, seeing is believing, what you see is what you get. There's a sense imminent in this picture that on issues of great public moment, it's possible for citizens to assess the facts of the matter in rather direct and commonplace ways. There's no need, as there almost surely would have been in the United States, for a mediating layer of official expertise. Of course, an interpretation like the one I'm giving you, giving you can't rest on a single picture. I only dare to read this one as I do because of years of immersion in case studies of British policymaking and importantly, equally deep immersion in cross-cultural comparisons between Britain and other countries. <coughs> But tonight I don't want to push this kind of comparative cultural analysis all the way, although it holds its own fascinating rewards. Instead, I want to show how misreading or underestimating the public's capabilities can have disastrous effects on relationships of public trust. The visual text I've shown thus far from the Mad Cow episode cannot be read alone. It landed in a rich interpretive environment that politicians could only imperfectly predict or control, producing ripples of meaning in both words and images. At the level of words, many newspapers and TV accounts poked fun at Gummer's apparent desperation in trying to stage a persuasive public drama. Here is one example of the way the story was retold. <laughs> Uh, 
But the responsive images are in some way more interesting, and I want to focus on a particular one. This image <laughs> by the widely admired car political cartoonist Gerald Scar. There's no hint in this image of a benevolent public servant successfully dishing out reassurance to a deferential public. Instead, Scarf's caustic pen captures an altogether more sinister view of the state. About the caption, what have we been fed? And of course, punning is a political resource as much as other things are. We see a black clad male figure force feeding a child shown midway between China doll and living human who is stiffly succumbing to the man's superior physical force. The child's head is held back as it was not in real life. The hamburger stuffed into the tender mouth. The image is violent, disturbing, with barely concealed overtones of forcible child abuse. No one who saw this image could have imagined a long and happy future ahead for a government that allowed itself to be thusly depicted, and its days, in fact, were numbered. In his turn, though, Scarf should not be read alone or out of context. Both visually and in metaphoric terms, he is reaching into a deep reservoir of political critique which in Britain has taken particular cultural forms. As an artist, Scarf self-consciously aligns himself with the vision of Britain's great 18th century cartoonist, James Gilray, whose fluid lines and contorted figures lampooned state power in a time of growing imperial ambition. For Gilray, as for many Britons, physical gluttony was a metaphor for political gluttony for political excess and the gluttony of power. In numerous cartoons, Gilray captured political actors and events through the lens of unchecked appetite. In this famous cartoon, for instance, entitled Of a Luxury Under the Horrors of Digestion, graceful lines and pretty muted colors belie the viciously accurate portrayal of the future George IV in a state of gross relaxation, picking his teeth after a massive meal. In another well-known image, monstrous craws at a new coalition feast. The theme, again, is the Prince of Wales's uncontrolled appetite and dissipation, with his parents, the king and queen, shown pathetically participating in a notorious parliamentary buyout of their son's enormous debts. The locus of power has shifted in Britain since Gilray's time, and the situations in which rulers are called to account for their performance have, shift, have altered almost beyond recognition. In particular, expertise, its construction, public manifestation, and defense were not matters of as urgent state concern in the 18th century. Today, those issues are ubiquitous and urgent. The elements that make up a nation's political imagination, however, arguably remain more constant over time. In a culture built on roast beef, a hamburger is never merely a sandwich. As Edmund Burke observed in 1770, speaking of the rest of colonies in America, when men imagine that their food is only a cover for poison, and when they neither love nor trust the hand that serves it, it is not the name of the roast beef of old England that will persuade them to sit down to the table that is spread for them. Poor John Gummer, uncritically reared in an insulated tradition of public service, he did not realize soon enough that embodying the state can be risky business. Governing bodies, political or royal, real or symbolic, can as readily attract satire as deference. Democratic skepticism is rather good at penetrating hollow performances, including claims that do not seem to bear any coherent relation to underlying evidence. Trying to occupy a polity's field of visual imagination with new symbols requires particular sensitivity to the objects that already inhabit it. The hapless UK agriculture minister clearly did not have the critical resources to recognize the salient elements of his own nation's culture of public reasoning, trust-making, and criticism. In turn, his ploy to serve as the embodied representative of expert rationality and so to win back public trust massively misfired. I've been talking directly and indirectly about the media's role in transporting scientific reality to us, and that brings me to my next point. 
in preparing for tonight's lecture, I had a conversation with a CBC reporter who eventually concluded that I had nothing new enough to say for his program. But I took away something rather more intriguing from our conversation. And that was his repeated insistence that we as individuals can never know enough to critically evaluate claims of expertise. Therefore, he seemed to think, we're doomed to remain at best passive spectators in a continual, he says, she says, war of scientific expertise. Of course it's true that none of us will ever be in a position to evaluate the most recent claims and counterclaims with respect to polar bears and sea ice, the evidence for Dr. Huang's misdeeds, or the projections of morbidity and mortality from mad cow disease, to take just a few of the examples I've mentioned tonight. I do know a few Harvard professors who think they could. But in well-functioning democracies, we need not do everything like this on our own. We can rely on institutions to do the work of skepticism and testing that builds and maintains trust in the products of our scientific and technological ingenuity but we do have to make sure that those institutions are serving us well as our eyes and ears for detecting weaknesses in knowledge and reason, and not simply as mechanical inscription devices for dominant economic or political interests. John Gummer's Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Food was not a good institutional model from that standpoint. But where should we look for better ones? In general, betraying my own professional training, I'd like to turn to the law as the institution that perhaps best epitomizes the virtues of civic skepticism in democratic societies. When it comes to science and technology, however, it's not clear that a legal system formed hand in hand with the surrounding economic order necessarily serves us ideally well. I'll briefly illustrate this point with an example from US law's engagement with biotechnology and contrast it with the response of your own legal system before I turn to my concluding observations for today. In 1980, the US Supreme Court handed down its landmark life patenting decision, Diamond versus Chakrabarty, paving the way to the commercial development of biotechnology. From an economic standpoint, that decision was rightly hailed as a milestone in that it extended clearly recognizable property rights into areas that had been previously too cloudy, contested, and risky for investing capital. But it was at the same time a remarkably uncritical decision. Specifically, in the guise of strict statutory interpretation, the majority silently reaffirmed and thereby removed from political questioning many presumptions about the pace, the benefits, and the nature of progress that publics have a right to question, a right they should perhaps be encouraged to exercise substantially more often. In one revealing moment, Chief Justice Warren Berger observed that legislative, and judi legislative or judicial fiat as to patentability will not deter the scientific mind from probing into the unknown any more than Knut could command the tides. In saying this, Berger painted science as an inexorable tidal force with the law obliged passively to follow suit. Yet nothing in the Chakrabarti opinion suggested that this case itself marked a moment of exceptional legal invent inventiveness when a court in effect created a novel type of commodity and thereby opened the door to new forms of hype and hope, investment and discovery with huge consequences for society. The path to the decision was studded with moments of choice, even though the court's rhetoric was of inevitability. One such moment concerned the court's decision that the patent law, as an instrument for furthering invention, should always be given an expansive reading. On this point, the court, in effect, bought into the argument advanced by Genentech, a leading biotech company. From the start, Genentech touted the values of exploration and advancement, with language like this. The patent system seeks not to catalog the past, but rather to compass the future. Genentech backed up such statements with evidence from legislative history, quoting congressional committee reports accompanying the law's 1952 reenactment. Genentech observed that, quote, patent laws are written in large and prospective terms so as to include anything under the sun that is made by man. This formulation proved influential with the Supreme Court. 
Justice Berger sustained the widest possible application of the law with a quotation from Thomas Jefferson, the author of the original American patent statute, ingenuity should receive a liberal encouragement, and he incorporated into his opinion the same bit of 1952 legislative history that Genentech had chosen to focus on, namely that the patent system should cover anything under the sun that is made by man. A second moment of choice was the court's decision to defer to the will of Congress by not requiring the legislature to consider the matter anew. Once again, this was a theme Genentech had articulated in its amicus brief or friend of the court brief, asserting that it was up to the legislature, not the courts, to decide what to include in or exclude from the broad compass of patentability. The Supreme Court agreed that restrictions on patenting, if there were to be any, had to come from Congress. Courts were institutionally incapable of making the right sorts of judgments. Any attempt to put the brakes on innovation would be fruitless anyway because, as I noted earlier, legislative or judicial fiat will not deter the scientific mind from probing into the unknown any more than Canute could command the tides. Even this classic metaphor of helplessness was not the court's own. In its brief, Genentech had written that it was not for the court, quote, to attempt, like King Canute, to command the tide of technological development. For the Chakrabarti majority, then, the mandate of the patent law was entirely clear. It was to further innovation by granting patents for anything that was a product of human ingenuity. All the relevant lines, legal, metaphysical, institutional, were bright lines admitting of no ambiguity. In particular, there was no question whether an object for which a patent was sought existed in nature or was the work of human hands. Anything on the non-human side of the boundary deserved a patent in accordance with the broad purposes of the law. Limiting patentability, hence limiting the circulation of inventions, was the step that required justification, and courts moreover lacked the institutional capacity to carve out exceptions. If there were slippery slopes and special dangers inherent in patenting life, these were matters that only lawmakers could competently address. However, by denying that this was a moment of lively ontological politics, that is, questions about the nature of disputed entities, the court's deferential stance in effect took the issue out of political circulation. The US Congress never had to deliberate the patenting of life. Did the decision have to go this way? Not necessarily. In this case, to see how things might have turned out otherwise, we can look to the Canadian Supreme Court's 2002 decision to refuse a patent on the so-called Harvard Onco Mouse. The case is particularly helpful in this regard because here, a five to four majority, the same one that ruled in favor of life patents in Chakrabarti, interpreted a law almost identical to that of the US, reached a very different, but reached a very different conclusion with regard to patenting higher organisms. The Onco Mouse was produced by researchers at Harvard University with funding from DuPont Company. The technique used to modify the Onco Mouse's genetic makeup involved injecting a fertilized mouse egg, preferably while it was still at the single cell stage with an Onco gene or gene that promotes cancer. The treated egg was then implanted in a female mouse and carried to term, eventually producing generations of offspring who contained the Onco gene in all their cells. The resulting cancer-prone animals can be used in scientific studies to test the cancer-causing or cancer-preventing potential of various substances. In May 2002, several environmental and animal rights organizations filed a memorandum with the Canadian Supreme Court requesting it to deny the patent on the mouse. Now, just as a matter of legal technicality, there was no question that you can grant a, a patent on the process of getting there. The, the only question was whether a patent could also be granted on the animal itself, and there the Canadian court held no. Countering a forcefully argued dissent, the five justices for the majority found differently from Chakrabarti on two important counts. Should a higher organism such as a mouse be considered a composition of matter, that's the language of the law, as understood in Canadian patent law, and is it deference to parliament or is it flouting parliamentary intent to refuse to extend, 
extend patent protection to higher organisms. On the first issue, the court concluded that composition of matter is too restrictive a term to encompass something so complex as a living animal, and that altering one gene in an animal's genome is not in any case equivalent to producing an entirely new composition. Here is a holding directly contradictory to the American view. Justice Michel Bassarache, writing for the majority, issued a ringing statement against genetic reductionism. It's hard to point out to you how odd language like this reads to an American lawyer because it's a kind of philosophizing language. Of course, the dissent objected to it too, but you never, it's very unlikely that you would find it in an American judicial opinion. Anyway, here is the passage that I rather like. Higher life forms, said the justice, are generally regarded as possessing qualities and characteristics that transcend the particular genetic material of which they are composed. A person whose genetic makeup is modified by radiation does not cease to be him or herself. Likewise, the same mouse would exist absent the injection of the oncogene into the fertilized egg cell. It simply would not be predisposed to cancer. The fact that it has this predisposition to cancer that makes it valuable to humans does not mean that the mouse, along with other animal life forms, can be defined solely with reference to the genetic matter of which it is composed. The fact that animal life forms have numerous unique qualities that transcend the particular matter of which they are composed makes it difficult to conceptualize higher life forms as mere compositions of matter. It is a phrase that seems inadequate as a description of a higher life form. The Canadian decision also approached the question of legislative intent <coughs> differently from Chakrabarti. Both courts agreed that broad social and environmental policy concerns were irrelevant to the implementation of patent law, but from that point, their views diverged. For the Canadian Supreme Court, the extension of patents to higher organisms was a large enough step that it raised concerns which only Parliament could properly address. Two issues that particularly exercised the majority were possible impacts on agriculture and on the patentability of human life. The court felt that extending patents to self-replicating plants and animals raised new issues that Parliament clearly had not thought of in passing the original law. On human life, the court similarly concluded that there was a need for line drawing that judges were not equipped to undertake. In my view, the majority said, it is not an appropriate judicial function for the courts to create an exception from patentability for human life, given that such an exception requires one to consider both what is human and which aspects of human life should be excluded. Thus, while both courts profess to defer to the legislature, the US court stretched the existing law to cover the new case rendering new legislative debate unnecessary. The Canadian court preferred to let the legislature have renewed say in an area it saw as raising questions that were morally and politically perplexing. One decision closely tracked industry's position and opened economic doorways while closing down democratic ones. The other decision took the opposite course. Which judgment should we prefer from the standpoint of generating public trust? It's time now to sum up both my talk and with it this challenging and timely series. It's become something of a fashion lately to attribute all the problems of democratic societies to breakdowns in trust and perhaps nowhere more so than in matters relating to the role of science and technology in society. Since science is thought to be intrinsically deserving of trust, how can one explain aberrations like the Bush administration's disregard for climate change, the persistence of creationism as a dogma, the refusal of British mothers to accept MMR vaccine, the South African president's known reluctance to accept the viral cause of AIDS, except by positing a radical breakdown in trust? Many consequences follow from this diagnosis, not least the theory that mistrust is born of ignorance and illiteracy especially ignorance of science. The attraction of the public understanding of science model for high-level science policymakers is but the most visible reflection of that account of trust. Against that conventional wisdom, 
I've advanced an alternative argument grounded in a different conception of us as citizens of knowledge societies. Stemming from law and policy, that view is of us as knowledge-able individuals and collect collectives who are capable and indeed who have positive rights and obligations to hold our experts and our ruling institutions to high standards of public reasoning. As we seek to exercise those rights, we should remember that no institutions, no matter how authoritative, are immune to failures of critical vision. The propensity to buy into dominant myths of scientific and technological progress is widely diffused throughout society, in courts, in parliaments, and in executive agencies. Our role, finally, is to make sure that neither we nor they fall comfortably back into patterns of passive acceptance and apathy. In one of Hans Christian Andersen's immortal fables, here illustrated by Edmund du Lac in a well-known illustration, the emperor and his courtiers, perhaps a parable for modern governments and their experts, are bound together in a community of mutual trust and esteem, their eyes so attuned to seeing things the same way that they can no longer see the evidence of their own senses. But it is the skeptical child, ignorant perhaps of the rituals and reasons of state, who sees things most clearly and who has the last laugh. Thank you for your attention. Sarah Williams. Mr. Chancellor, I have the honor to present to you for the degree of Bachelor of Applied Science in Radiography, those students whose names shall be announced individually and whose qualifications for this degree have been approved by the Senate. Lacey Costain. <laughs> Tanya Diane McKay. Dana Sabine. And Mr. Chancellor, I have the honor to present to you for the degree of Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, those students whose names shall be announced individually and whose qualifications for this degree have been approved by the Senate. Turi Kenna Arness. Dr. Michelle Bolin Allen. Dr. Patrick Howard Allen.